Okay, hey, so welcome back everybody and welcome to our online students. Today what we're going to do is we're going to continue on with the sizes of atoms and ions to the next step and that is taking a look at something called ionization energies. And ionization energies is just a fancy term that means how much energy does it take to remove an electron? So how much energy does it take to remove an electron from an atom? And it could be one electron, it could be multiple electrons. Now, um, this here is just a, a, a graphic representation. We've got an atom, we have a nucleus in the center, and then you have an, a, uh, an electron that's breaking free. Freedom, it's, it's moving on. And so it, there is some amount of energy it takes to remove these electrons from atoms. Because remember, the, the nucleus is positively charged and it, it wants to hold those electrons in place. So it's going to take some energy to remove them. Now there's some fancy terms for this here. We have this ionization energy. Ionization energy is the amount needed to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of ground state atoms or ions in the gas phase. <sighs> oh, try to say that without breathing. Um, it's a lot of gobbledygook. It just means how much energy does it take to remove an electron. And we have first ionization energies and we have second ionization energies. And we could go third, fourth, fifth. And what does that mean? First ionization energy is the energy to remove that first electron. Second ionization energy would be the energy to remove the second electron, and so on and so forth. And every time we remove an electron, each additional electron takes more energy. So you remove the first electron, takes some amount of energy. Second electron will take a little bit more, and then the next more and more and more and more. So each time we remove electrons, it takes more and more energy. Now there's a table in your textbook that shows us the ionization energies, the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron. And when I pop this one up here, here's, here's the ionization energy table here. Um, students often ask, okay, Professor Locken, do I need to memorize this? And if I'm in a really bad passive aggressive mood, I'll say yes. But the answer is no, you don't need to memorize this. So just take a moment and just look at this and see if you can't find some trends. See if you notice a trend or two in there. Now, can you tell me one thing that you notice about this table? Just one thing that sticks out in your mind? Yeah. The smaller the atom, the higher the ionization energy. Day gum, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So on, on our periodic tables, if you had a periodic table that if you had a professor that loved you, might have shared with you, we, we remember that the size or the radii goes something like this. So radii, radii goes like this, okay, and like this, where francium down here would be the largest element, and then helium over here would be the smallest. Now this is just diagrammatic, it's not a perfect um, periodic table, but you know, francium would be somewhere down in this corner. Okay, so the radius goes this way, and then the ionization energies, as you eloquently pointed out, go in the opposite direction. So I'm going to say ionization energy, i.e., goes in the opposite direction, in the opposite direction like this, ionization energy, okay. And so it seems as though the smallest, the smaller an atom is, the harder it will be to remove an electron. It's almost as if, if those electrons are closer to the nucleus, it's harder to pull them away. Does it kind of make sense? The closer those electrons are to the nucleus, the harder it will be to pull them away. So yes, yes, that is something we should file away, maybe put a star next to it, put a pin in that, because we're gonna come back to that theme. Thank you. Is there anything else you notice about this? Any other trends, perhaps, or, or anything that looks odd? Yeah. The elements that have the smaller number of electrons, the harder it is to pull away. 
Yeah, so, so for example, um, hydrogen and helium have very few electrons. They're also very small, and it's gonna be hard to pull those electrons away. Yeah, excellent. Um, so atoms with lots of electrons, a little, more, a little easier, generally a little bit easier. Anything else that, that, we, that we notice? Anything odd that sticks out in our minds? Yeah. Oxygen has a lower ionization energy than nitrogen. Yeah, that is a little weird. That does kind of break the trend, doesn't it? You see that? And you say, so what's, what makes nitrogen so special? It makes up 79% of the atmosphere, so I'm a big fan of it. But, but what makes nitrogen special? Any thoughts about what, what's special about nitrogen? Hmm. Yeah? Its electron configuration is half full. Hey, I'm noticing people are dressed kind of snazzy today. Is there like a job fair or something going on? Okay, so it's not just you know for me. You could have you could have lied. I would have believed you. Okay, um, you know looking sharp today. Um, nice. Okay, yes. So nitrogen has a half filled orbital. So if we were to do the electron configuration for nitrogen, we go nitrogen looks something like this, where it is a one s two two s two. 2p123. Is that correct? And so then if we were to do the orbital diagram for this, orbital diagram for nitrogen, this here would be the 1s, and then we'd have the 2s would look like this, and then our 2p, we'll get our three degenerate orbitals, looks like this. And then if we put in our electrons, our electrons, I have two here, so that's gonna be two. And then I've got two here, like that, okay. And then here, oh, I, I didn't label that. That's, this is our 2p, and then there's three of them. And so those three electrons go like this, according to Hund's rule. And we remember that half-filled orbitals are a little more stable, or completely filled orbitals are a little more stable. And so nitrogen having a half-filled orbital and being a fairly small element, um, yeah, it's a little more stable, so it's a little harder to pull that electron away. Oh my gosh, did we just use quantum mechanics to explain an anomaly with ionization energies? Oh, wow. All right, any, any other questions or observations? Yeah. Why are the metals not there? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, those transition elements, why are they not? Because they're a mess. How's that? Yeah, they're just, oh man, they're all over the place. You wanna talk about a schizophrenic part of the, of the periodic table? Yeah. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you than that. Now students ask, okay, so what do I need to know? Right, as, as long as you remember, the relationship between size and ionization energy, relatively speaking, you should be good. That'll be good for, for, for general chemistry. Later on, if you take inorganic chemistry, then they'll, they'll spend more time with the transition elements. Um, but if you're not a chemistry major, you, you probably won't take inorganic chemistry. So you're, I don't wanna say you're safe. Oh, darn, you're gonna miss that opportunity. How's that? Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, all right, so don't need to memorize this. Now here's another table. This one shows successive ionization energies. So for example, if we remove more than one electron, how much energy does it take? And so if we start um, up here, let's just start here with lithium. Now lithium, it's the third element down, it shows us here the ionization is 520, and that's just some number. Okay, just some number. And then, I mean, it's kilojoules per mole, but it's just a number. And then when we try to remove the second electron, it gets very expensive. And the third is also very expensive. Okay, so there's lithium. So lithium right here, we can remove one, not too, not too much, but trying to remove two or three gets very expensive. Okay, so we'll just 
just put that aside for just a second. And then let's take a look here. Let's let's move down here. Do we have potassium? No, we don't have potassium. We don't have lithium. Uh, well, okay, well, let's take a look at beryllium here. Here's beryllium, BE. BE, we can remove one. We can remove two. Not too expensive, but dang gum, you jump to that third electron, it gets very expensive. Very expensive to try to remove that third electron. So what's the deal? Why is it easy to remove one from lithium, but two from beryllium? Any thoughts on that? Look at where they're at in the periodic table. Yeah, what are you thinking? Yeah, so it, 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 he was saying that as you get to a completely filled orbital or a Nobel gas configuration, um, it gets harder to pull, pull electrons away. So once you get to that Nobel gas configuration, you're good. Anything beyond that gets very expensive. So for example, we take a look at lithium here. Lithium is one spot away from Nobel gas configuration. That is to say, if we remove just one electron, lithium becomes plus one, and we have a Nobel gas configuration. Trying to go beyond that gets very expensive. Beryllium is two spots away. We can remove one, two electrons. That gets us here. And then once we're here, if we try to remove that third electron, it becomes very expensive. So I tell people, you don't need to memorize this table. I've seen students try. You don't need to memorize the table if we just recognize on our periodic table, elements want to gain or lose electrons to have a Nobel gas configuration. Once they do, they don't want to give up anything else. They don't want to give up any more. Right? It's kind of like you're just driving down the street, Bradley Cooper pulls up in the convertible, is like, hey, hop in, right? You're like, do you have any candy? All right, you hop right in. And, and then you know, you're riding along in the convertible with Bradley Cooper, and then somebody else says, hey, get out of the convertible, right? I want to ride. And you're like, uh-uh. No, just me? All right. <laughs> Guess that analogy didn't work. OK, now, um, which atom has the highest second ionization energy? Second ionization energy. All right, so take a look at this. You can check with your neighbors. Let's see what we have for an answer. OK, somebody, do we have a brave soul here, somebody who, who wants to try give this one a shot here. Do we have a brave soul? Yes. Is it A, potassium? OK, talk me through. Why, why did you think, why did we come up with A, potassium? Yep, so potassium wants to lose one, right? Yep, so it wants to lose one, yep. So if you try to take a second one away, it's going to be very expensive. Yeah, nicely done, nicely done. Calcium, scandium, barium, all could give up two electrons easily. Um, but potassium only wants to give up one. Nicely done, nicely done. All right, now this one's going to be a little trickier. These ones have already lost electrons. Have already lost electrons. Hmm. Hmm. They're going to be isoelectronic, perhaps, with something. Take a couple of moments. Check with your neighbors. Which one of these species is it most difficult to remove one electron? So between these four different ions, they've all already lost one or more electrons. Which one of these is it going to be the most difficult to remove one more electron? Do we have a brave soul? Yes. Thinking lithium, OK. Yeah, so, so talk us through this. All four of those have a Nobel gas configuration. All four of them are isoelectronic with the Nobel gas. I'm trying to throw in those vocabulary words, right? Um, so all four of them are, are uh, isoelectronic with Nobel gas, but the lithium is going to be the smallest. It's isoelectronic with helium, which happens to be our smallest radius. 
So it's going to be the most difficult to pull away an electron, right? And oh my gosh, did, did you memorize this? No, you didn't. You didn't have to because you understand, right? It's the powers of the mind. Ah, oh, okay. Nicely done. Nicely done. Well, well done. 